Hey Geekscapists, Tessa Markle here, one half of the team at FemRegard Podcast, and I want to talk to you guys today about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So Buffy has got a full-blown fandom. You know, people are obsessed with Buffy, and I get it. And if you guys have watched my other videos on Geekscape, you know I usually have a t-shirt associated with whatever I'm talking about. I don't have a t-shirt this time, but I do have Mr. Pointy, because <laughs> I went as Buffy for Halloween one year, wanted to cosplay as her at Comic-Con, and then lockdown happened, so on and so forth. I'll be honest, I didn't get into Buffy until I was a full-grown adult. Um, an ex of mine was like, you know, I think you might really like the show, you like vampires, you know, I think you'll find it funny. And when I was growing up, I had a lot of friends that were into Buffy, but I just felt like I was a little bit too young to really get it, you know? When I was older and had seen like one-off episodes, I just thought it was kind of cheesy. Wasn't really into Joss Whedon's humor yet, <laughs> but you know, whatever he is as a person, I don't care. His art, I have fallen in love with, and this is the show that did that for me. So I'm really glad that I took the time, embraced the cheese, <laughs> and just really dove into it because I had a lot of fun watching the entire series. And I think we can all agree that Buffy is well worth the celebration. Okay, so let's talk characters. Buffy does a really good job of allowing the characters in the series to really have their full arc and to really grow. And you know, we are introduced to a lot of characters that are only there for a small amount of time, like Kendra, for instance, or a somewhat small amount of time, but a big impact, like Angel. We're not gonna get into the Angel series because I'm not a fan of that, but you know, everyone has their own opinion. But, you know, the main characters, Buffy, Xander, Willow, Spike, like they really get to grow and change, especially I would argue Willow and Spike the most. Let's talk about Willow first. So, you know, we get to see her whole progression as she comes into her own and really finally gets, you know, some confidence and strength and the things that you knew were probably there underneath in high school, she really comes to find herself in college. And then she comes out as a lesbian, which I thought was really freaking cool because, you know, this was airing at a time when there were gay characters on TV, but it wasn't really talked about so much or it was kind of just implied or, you know, whatever. But in the series, you know, Willow falls in love with another woman. Like, how cool is that that they really, you know, broke the mold with that. And then later on though, you get to see Evil Willow, which is kind of cool because I really feel like, you know, the spiritual community calls it your shadow side. But you know, it was kind of Willow unintentionally <laughs> embracing her dark side and really seeing how powerful she could be, but also realizing how dangerous that really is. So I thought that that was a really cool exploration of of your dark side and of magic and dark magic and all that kind of stuff. So I really loved that and I feel like yeah Willow just became stronger and stronger and more and more real. You know she went from kind of the awkward funny character to a really strong confident complicated woman. And then Spike I mean I think it's pretty obvious how he went from just full-on villain to suddenly him and Buffy are hooking up <laughs> and then he's in love with her. You know, it's it really shows the layers, you know, that they built into these characters that nobody is one dimensional. You know, even the ones that we think from the very beginning are gonna be the absolute bad guys, they can completely grow and change. And even Xander, I mean, Xander doesn't change that much. He's always kind of the goofball, but you know, as he progresses, as his character progresses, you do see him grow up and you see him want to be more serious and you see him want to be a real adult and to be responsible. And it's just, it's really beautiful to see all these characters evolve, you know, and the show was on for a handful of seasons. Uh, we got to see them go through high school and through college. And I think that they kind of did a good job at deciding that was the timeline that they should follow and that was the um that there was an ending to it you know that that they weren't just gonna let the show go on and on and these kids are getting older and older and suddenly they're 35 and it's you know 20 years later i, I think we would have been sick of it by then so it was really nice to get to see that growth but to still have 
an end point to it. And while we're on the topic of characters, I want to get into some of the smaller characters. Not necessarily smaller, but not, you know, main carry through the entire series characters kind of characters. Did I say characters enough times? First, I want to get into my favorite, Anya. Anya was introduced later on in the series. Um, she became Xander's girlfriend, and she's a demon um, who's really just kind of trying to be a normal girl. Her struggles are hilarious to me. And I feel like being a demon, trying to be a normal girl is really just most of us trying to adapt to society and not say all the things that we're thinking and not do all the things that we want to do to other people. And it's just, it's so fun to watch. I just, yeah, she's absolutely my favorite character. Another one is Angel, like I mentioned earlier. I am not a fan of Angel. I was definitely Team Spike the entire time. You know, I'm not saying that was a healthy relationship either. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just felt like Angel was one of those, you know, they introduced him as the heartthrob and that's kind of all I was good for. I don't know, sorry, not sorry. Let's talk about Giles. We haven't talked about Giles yet because you know, he is definitely a main character. He definitely helps propel the entire series forward, but I don't feel like he always gets the character development that the kids do. And we do see in a few episodes, you know, we get to see him date for a little while. We get to see when he tries to retire and, you know, we do get insights into his life, but just not as much. So it's, it's even more interesting when we do really get a peek into his life. Okay, so now let's just talk about the world of Buffy, you know? So if you're not familiar with the show, um, basically Buffy's high school was built on a hell mouth, meaning that all the evil stuff could come through from hell, through the high school and infect the world. So <laughs> namely that is a lot of vampires. And I love a good vampire story. They have existed throughout time and there's always something a little different with everyone. You know, in Twilight, you've got the sparkly vampires. In Interview with a Vampire, they can read minds, I believe. I'm pretty sure that's what maybe that's from. You know, there's so many things that you can put onto a vampire as a creator to make it more interesting. One of the things that I thought was interest an interesting choice from Joss Whedon is that all of the vampires in the show whenever they kind of let out that they're a vampire, you know, fully become a vampire, their face changes and they get really ugly. He chose to do this because he didn't want people seeing, you know, violence against teenagers, essentially. A lot of the kids were in high school and they didn't want to show that on TV. So he thought that it would be better if they actually looked like this, these monstrous creatures whenever they were doing something bad or whenever Buffy was kill him, which I thought was an interesting choice. And I don't think that anybody had really done that before necessarily. Like the vampires kind of just either looked like monsters or didn't. So I think that was an interesting choice. I also think it was interesting, which I'm assuming was for the same reason that whenever they get spiked, they just turn into dust, you know, and it's not some bloody gory, whatever, whatever, because this was a show for young adults and it was on normal television. So, you know, they had to be kind of careful with what they were doing. I also love that there is so much lore that is taken from actual history. I don't know if you call it history, if it's the occult, but you know, actual mythology and occultism and, and all of these things, um, you know, they did the research. I love that they did that and also put their own twists on it, you know, and it just makes it fun and modern and because most of the audience, like I said, was young adults, you know, probably teenagers, maybe young, you know, 20 somethings, whatever. And chances are most of the audience wasn't familiar with the occult. So, you know, they're learning all of these things along with the kids in the show. And it's fun because it's, you know, you're, you become so enveloped in this world that you kind of feel like them. When they learn about a new demon, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense because they're, you know, revenge demons. So they're going to do this and they came from this. And it's it's a cool, fun way to like get interested and, and learn about this kind of stuff. 
along with the characters on the show. You know, you never feel dumb. You never feel like, oh, I should know that. Or you never feel like, why in the hell would anybody know that, you know? So it's a lot of fun in that way. And I think it was a really cool way to introduce these kind of, you know, horror elements without making the show scary. It was really just lighthearted and fun. Even when crazy stuff was going down and, you know, kids were close to death, like there was always some good comic relief. And I think that that just is a testament to the show itself, you know? Um, they did a really, really good job of balancing these intense issues and sometimes real, wor real world issues. It wasn't always just the monsters, you know? And just everyday teenage issues, you know? And the kids trying to figure out who to take to prom and, and what if I'm in love with two people and, you know, all of these things wrapped up together. And it was fun and it was lighthearted and you were gonna laugh the whole way through. And of course I have to mention Buffy the Vampire Slayer the movie, which came out I believe about five years before the series started. And when I thought that the series was cheesy, <laughs> let me just tell you, this movie is ridiculous. It was super fun to watch. I'm really glad that I waited until after I had watched the series to go back and watch the movie because I don't think I would have enjoyed it as much. I think I would have just kind of written it off. You know, it introduced us to this fun world. Again, this was really kind of the first series of its time to, or series movie anything, of its time to address vampires in a way like this. And I could be wrong, there could be, you know, smaller movies and stuff that I've never heard of that make vampires fun. <laughs> but, you know, really, throughout history, the stories have always been that, you know, vampires are these monsters and, you know, they're motivated by blood and blah 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 we all know what vampires are right well yes they're monsters and they're motivated to kill and they're evil and all these things in Buffy as well but we really get to see the human side of them as well because we get to see a a lot of kids turned into vampires so we know where they came from we know that they were actually human first you know and then B we get to see an inside look at the actual vampires lives like Spike, we get his whole backstory and it's actually really sad and you actually really feel bad for him. And Drusilla and how complicated of a character she is because, you know, I feel like throughout her arc in the series, you like hate her and then you feel bad for her and then you kind of love her and then you hate her again. And it's just, you know, it's, it's so complicated and it's so fun to really get to see these layers. And you know, I would argue this is kind of the precursor to Twilight. I don't think that a story like Twilight would have been as popular had something like this not existed first. Um, so it came at a really good time. Um, and then, like I said, the series began about five years after the movie. Kind of gave us some time to stew. I mean, I was too young when the movie came out to watch it, but I imagine if I had seen that as a young teenager, I would have been really excited when the series started. As I mentioned earlier, I love that you really got to see the growth in the series and that in the end it came to an end you know it wasn't an abrupt canceling like it was actually a decision by the writers and it allows you to just then sit with it like i will take a show ending in you know two or three seasons even though i absolutely love it because it was the choice was made to end it over a show that goes on and on and on and on, and on until it just has to be canceled you know, I'd much rather see them wrap things up, you know? Um, so I'm really glad that we got to see that with Buffy. And although Angel did not have the same fate, um, like I said, I'm okay with that. <laughs> but I will say, as much as I'm not a fan of Angel, it was a cool thing to have a spinoff running at the same time and to, to allow the audience to have more, to see this other side of the story, you know? Honestly, if I would have watched Buffy when it was on, I probably would have loved Angel because it would have given me more content. It would have given me more to follow. And the last thing I want to talk about, which I've mentioned a little bit throughout this video, why I think Buffy is so important and why I think people really loved it so much. And that's because it was relatable. Like, no matter what, any show, no matter what it's about, vampires. Okay, how many of us have actually met a real life vampire or worry about vampires in real life, right? But the characters and the things that they're dealing with and the storyline and just all of the elements are still relatable. 
that's the thing that makes people love shows. You know, and the show, as I said, was geared towards high school students, college students, and these kids, while yes, they are battling demons and vampires from this hellmouth, they're also dealing with normal high school stuff. And there's so many times in the show whenever Buffy talks about that. She's like, you know, I just want to worry about what I'm going to wear on my date on Friday. I don't want to have to kill these demons today, you know? And Willow's just worrying about, is she going to get a good grade on this test while she's trying to research how to pulverize a revenge demon, you know? And then Xander's just trying to get a date with a girl. <laughs> and just not really doing much else. It's fun to get to see these characters juggling all of these things, but going through normal human stuff. And you get to see even, as I mentioned earlier, the monsters, monsters quote unquote, get to go through normal human stuff. You get to see Spike wrestling with, you know, Buffy's supposed to be my adversary and I'm in love with her, but she's also in love with Angel. And how, what do I do? You know, meanwhile, like, in the beginning of the series, he was the number one baddie. I think that's what really made Buffy so popular. You know, we really got to be enveloped in this fantasy world that just felt like real life. You know, it all felt like it could just happen to any of us. High school was hell for a lot of people. Who's to say it couldn't have been on a hell mouth?